Let's Talk Native is produced at the LTN Studios on the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. We may step on a few toes through our examination of culture, art, politics, history, and identity. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Sego, I'm John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Hey, I need to revisit the uh, the battle that's been ensuing between the Seneca Nation and New York State over gaming revenue, over revenue sharing, I should say. Um, there's been some movement this week, some positive movement, I think, but probably not as much movement as there should be, and we'll see what comes down the pike. Let me start by talking about the uh, the press release of the Seneca Nation issue just a few days ago on April 23rd. It was their press release announcing that they had um, asked the federal court to stay all proceedings for for 45 days in response to the United States Department of Interior's declaration that it has yet to review the legality of the payment provisions of the Seneca Nation's Class 3 Gaming Compact with New York State. At, at the heart of it is what I've been talking about for years is that there's never been a proper review um, by the Interior Department of the of the revenue sharing provision of the the gaming compact between the Seneca Nation and uh, and New York State, and specifically, this has become an issue because of the the again the fight between New York State and the Seneca Nation over the renewal period of the compact. And as many of you may recall, uh, the Seneca Nation paid for fourteen years. Uh, a revenue sharing for a concession the state was to, supposed to have made uh, that was supposed to give them give the Seneca Nation a competitive advantage. It was supposed to be an exclusivity uh, um, zone, uh, and the Seneca Nation paid dearly for it. They paid 18% for a couple of years. They paid 22%, but for the bulk of, the, uh, of that first year, compact period that 14 years 17 years or seven years of it they paid 25 percent of the net slot drop so what the total came to was 1.6 billion dollars now there was a dispute along the way where the Seneca Nation withheld those payments and then negotiated a settlement on that dispute where they kept 200 million of it so uh, so the state during that 14 year period collected 1.4 billion dollars 400 million of it came back to Western New York, but the state pocketed a billion dollars and they pocketed that billion dollars based on a concession that they allegedly made to the Seneca Nation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because the only way revenue sharing is legal under the federal statute, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, is if the state gives up something. So they give something up to the gaming nation uh, and the and the nation pays them you know, share some of the revenue for that concession, but that's something the state has to give up has to have a real value to it. it has to be, and I'm quoting the Interior Department, it has to be both substantial and quantifiable. But at this point, what the Seneca Nation is raising isn't about the 1.4 billion dollars they paid. It's the next billion dollars that the state is trying to press them on, and this is where this one gets a little dicey. See, they renewed the compact after 14 years, but there's no language in the renewal provision of that compact that talks about payments continuing. So the Senate Canadian just said, okay, we paid for, for 14 years. Well, yeah, we got screwed, um, but we're not going to pay for the next for the next seven or that next seven-year renewal period. And that seven-year renewal period goes from, um, from 2017, back a few years already, through uh 2023 that's seven years so that's that seven year period which essentially would would be another billion dollars obviously we're halfway through that already and the Seneca Nation already has a half a billion dollars the state is claiming that they owe them so what the nation did back in March with this new interior department was put in a request that the interior department uh, department review 
the fact that the state in arbitration got two of those judges to say, well, it doesn't say that they have to pay for seven years, the next seven years, but we're going to, we're going to rule that you have to pay. So for all intents and purposes, two judges on this arbitration panel rewrote language and added language to the compact, which would require the interior department to review it. So what the interior department has now responded, and, and I mean, just responded, was that they need to review this. They, the letter explains that in 2002, when the compact commenced, the department did not review whether revenue sharing during the seven year renewal period, that's the one we're in right now, was lawful because the, the compact terms did not provide any payments beyond the original 14. So what they're saying is the, the interior department never, never offered a review of the payments through the, the period that we're now in, this renewal period of seven years, because there was no language in there, which is what the Seneca Nation's argument was. So now the Interior Department is looking at whether the current revenue sharing provision of the, of the gaming compact is, is legal under, uh, under IGRA. Uh, and, and, and if it's legal, then they have to make that determination. They are the, the agency. The Interior Department is the agency that makes that ruling. Now, this is a good start. And I say it's a start because this is only about looking at the gaming compact that the Seneca Nation has with New York State. It, it's not about really even addressing, as I mentioned before, the overall revenue sharing provision and the leverage that, this, that the states have to force revenue sharing. And so I want to raise those two questions. So again, the first question is, do, is the compact as it's written, is it legal for the state to force even through arbitration, the Seneca Nation to pay another billion dollars worth of revenue sharing when there was no language in the original compact. Two arbitration judges, basically arbitration panel judges, said so. But the Seneca Nation's position all along was that if they're going to add language, any change to the compact has to go in front of the Interior Department. Obviously, the Interior Department has been derelict in its responsibility for multiple administrations, you know, Clinton and Bush and uh, Obama and obviously Trump. So now, like I said, I, I, I'm as cynical and suspect as anybody, but now there's a native person as they head of the Interior. The question is, is there going to be proper review? It looks like we got there's a commitment for the Interior Department to, to do a review. But here's the thing. That's just one question. And that one question is about the compact. The two bigger questions that relate to this are questions about IGRA, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. And the first question is, are any of these state revenue sharing provisions, are they, are they legal if they haven't met that standard that the Interior Department said they had to meet? And that standard was that the state has to offer a concession in exchange for revenue sharing, that is both substantial and quantifiable. So look, again, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act prohibits a state from taxing a native, uh, a native game, gaming venue. They cannot force a payment. They cannot squeeze a, a, a native territory for money out of their gaming, uh, their, their gaming enterprise. They can offer a concession that has to be valuable and then get a requisite value in terms of revenue sharing for what they conceded. So here's what the state claims they offered. They, they claim they offered an ex exclusivity in the 15 Western counties of, of New York that the Seneca Nation would have the exclusive right to do um, gaming, to do class three gaming. So for the state to have said that, first off, is, is fine, but... But did the state give up their right to do class three gaming or to authorize any other gaming? No, they didn't. And, and here's why. Because the state couldn't do class three gaming. So the state didn't, didn't prohibit themselves based on this compact from doing gaming so that the Seneca Nation had their exclusivity. They just basically said, we'll, uh, you'll be the only, only game in town. Of course, the only other person, places that could have done gaming potentially were Tuscarora and Tonawanda in Western New York. And frankly, they still could have. There was nothing in the compact that could have limited them. But the state did not give up their gaming right to the Seneca Nation in exchange for this revenue sharing. They basically said, you will have the exclusive right. They already had the exclusive right to do class three gaming. To the extent the state could compete against the Seneca Nation in areas that were evolving in terms of 
definitions of what a class two gaming machine was versus a class three gaming machine to the extent the state could do uh, any competition against the Seneca Nation? They absolutely did, even in that 15-county area, even in that western New York area. They actually put slot parlors in three racetracks, three horse racing racetracks. The uh, um, Hamburg Fairgrounds, which is a, essentially a, a racetrack uh, uh, that has legal horse betting that goes on there, uh, uh, regulated by the state. Batavia Downs and Finger Lakes. The, these three horse racing tracks expanded into slot parlors. In fact, they called those three facilities casinos. They didn't, they didn't beat around the bush. So, so for all intents and purposes, the state had three casinos in the exclusivity area. Now, what the state argued was, yeah, but those are class two machines. Okay, regardless of whether they were class two machines, they were those machines looked and played just like slot machines, and they competed directly against the Seneca Nation. So for all intents and purposes... The, the state was competing directly against the Seneca Nation in spite of the fact that Seneca Nation was paying, at this point, was paying 25% of the net slot drop to the state for an exclusivity that didn't exist. And, and again, let me say it again. The state did not give up Class 3 gaming to the Seneca Nation. They did not give up Class 3 gaming in the compact. They couldn't do Class 3 gaming through those, uh, at least through that 14 years of that initial period. Why? Because it was prohibited. The state had to, and indeed did, get a constitutional amendment that allowed them to open up Class 3 gaming. But though the, fast, the first Class 3 gaming facilities licensed by the state didn't open until this period was done. Until Literally, until this 14-year period was done. So that 14 years that the Seneca Nation was paying and, and knowing, <laughs> knowingly paid, because they, they knew they had agreed to this, they had paid the, the state of New York $1.4 billion and the state didn't give up anything. It didn't give up anything. And in fact, to the extent that it could compete against the Seneca Nation, it did indeed compete against the Seneca Nation. So that's a problem. So the question has to be not just about the seven-year period, renewal period, you know, those years that have passed, we're, we're already in 2021, and we've already gone through 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and, 20, and now we're in 2021. Not just this period that we're in, but even that period, that 14-year period, did the, the test, the standard for whether revenue sharing was legal, was it met? Was what the state gave quantifiable, and substantial. Well, I would argue that, yeah, you can quantify it. You can quantify it by pulling in a gaming expert, anybody, and, and just look at the facts. Did the state give something up? And then what was the value that they uh, of what they gave up? Well, the state gave up nothing. And, except, and in fact, like, as I said, expanded gaming in the Seneca's exclusivity zone. So they gave up nothing and yet received $1.4 billion. So if you're going to try to determine, well, what is the value of what the state claims was their concession, then somebody else has to do that. And, and, it's, a, and it's a requirement, according to the Interior Department. According to the Interior Department, the concession has to be quantified. You have to be able to put a value on it. And when you do put that value on it, that value better match up to what, uh, what the, uh, the gaming nation, Seneca Nation in this case, paid the state. And, and in fact... It, it, it shouldn't even be a wash. It should be an advantage. It should be a, a clear advantage for the Seneca Nation to accept that concession because it's going to improve their business model. And even paying the state, they're in a better spot because of that exclusivity. And, and look, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, to, to figure out that the, the best case scenario for the Seneca Nation was not paying for some weak or non-existent exclusivity and paying 25% of the net slot drop. But their, their best competitive advantage was not paying anything because who could build a casino right alongside a Seneca Nation casino or any place even close to a Seneca Nation casino if they were paying 30, 40, percent to or, you know to New York State while the Seneca Nation was paying nothing. Who could compete against a gaming uh, an already an established gaming facility that's got a 25 to 30 maybe even 40 plus um percent operating um margin a better operating margin. I mean nobody would even finance a casino 
that would go that would have to compete against somebody who's got such an advantage. So the the real competitive advantage would have come from the Seneca Nation by not paying the state rather than paying the state. So this is what the Interior Department really has to look at. I mean, was that 14 year period legal? Not just is the next seven, but was that 14 year period legal? When you consider that the state didn't really concede anything, they, I mean, they couldn't do gaming anyway. They couldn't do class three gaming. They couldn't do a, a full fledged casino the way they do now. And, and that during that 14 year period anyway. So the question has, has to be asked is, well, what value was what the Senate, what the New York, what New York state gave up to the Seneca nation? What value was it? Was it worth $1.4 billion? And I'll come back to that because that's the one question. And that question is important because it's not just important to New York state. Are any of these states who are squeezing gaming revenue out of native casinos in, in, you know, under the, the guise of revenue sharing, are any of them giving something to any of these territories, any of these gaming operations that increases their bottom line anywhere near what, what any of these places are, 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 are providing in, in terms of uh, revenue sharing to the states. And this is Oklahoma, this is New Mexico, this is California, any of these places. Certainly New York State. And New York State isn't just squeezing the Seneca Nation. They're squeezing Oneida Nation. They're squeezing Arkwasasne. So this is, a, this is a major issue. And this, again, this is a failure of the Interior Department because they've never addressed this. And of course, what really gives the state leverage over this is 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 the third question and the third question is does the state or any state have the power to force the closure of a native casino simply by walking away or refusing to to renew a gaming compact does the state literally have the veto power over whether a native casino operates or not now of course that sounds like a, oh, of course not but it's not that simple. The reason the Seneca Nation, when they withheld payments back, you know, in that period that where they settled it back in 2023 or 2013, I mean, and they and they took 200 million and and gave up the rest to the state and kept paying it 25 percent. The reason they did that because was because they believed if they didn't give in to the state somewhat, even though they kept 200 million dollars, if they didn't give in to the state, the state would not renew the compact that automatic renewal <laughs> in, in, uh, at the end of 2016, the seven year period that we're in at right now, every counselor and the president and the treasurer believed that if they didn't buy the political will from the state to renew the compact, that it wouldn't get renewed and they'd be shut down. This doesn't even have to be a, an explicit threat. If the belief is, and if that belief is coming from their own legal counsel, if it's coming from, you know, consultants and lobbyists and, you know, and gaming experts, if they're, if they're all telling the Seneca nation or any nation for that matter, that you've got to play the state's game because if they don't renew your compact, you'll, you'll get shut down. Now, I don't believe that's true. And here's why I don't believe it's true. And I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Let me, <laughs> let me be clear. But the way that thing was sold to native territories, one of the ways it was sold was that its intent was to prevent organized crime and overly aggressive states from taking advantage of native gaming. You know, they just didn't want native gaming to be exploited by, by others. It was supposed to be a boon, an opportunity for native territories, not for the states, not for the mob, which oftentimes, you know, certainly New York State are the same thing. So, what they had in the original um, form of, of IGRA, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, was a provision that said if a state fails to, to no, negotiate in good faith with a nation over a gaming compact, whether it's an initial gaming compact or whether it's a renew, renewal, if a state refuses, then the native gaming the nation, the native nation can sue the state and force them into... Uh, 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 a good faith negotiation that wasn't that was written into, into igra but florida challenged it and they prevailed they said you can't force 
you can't create a federal statute that allows the state to be sued by by Indians. And the Supreme Court, I mean, there's a, I, I don't know what um, um, amendment it is, but it's like the, uh, I want to say it's the 11th Amendment or something like, of, the, of the U.S. Constitution that doesn't allow the federal government to put the states in harm's way legally or some sort of liability. So Florida prevailed. So they struck that part of the, uh, of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. So by striking it, they took away the leverage that a nation had that put, you know that kept nations uh, at a, at a level uh, playing field with with the state, so the state couldn't just refuse to to work with with a nation, and they they couldn't just out of vindictiveness or you know some other agenda like revenue sharing, um, put their willingness to enter into a compact or renew a compact, dangle it out there for a price. I mean that was you know that's. That's why that provision was in there. And now that it was gone, so uh, what existed in its place? Well, much of the talk went back to the federal government saying, well, look, if a state won't negotiate a compact, then the federal government can step up. But there was never any real determination. And, and, then, and the question was never asked or answered whether by stripping away that provision of, the, uh, of, of IGRA, did the states now essentially have that veto power? Could a state force a shutdown of a native game, an, an operating, an existing gaming operation? I mean, the Santa Nation's got a you know, billion-dollar enterprise. Could New York State, for any reason or no reason at all, just say, no, nah, we're not going to renew. I mean, let's think about this. The state's in the business now. I mean, the state has state operating casinos. In fact, the closest casino uh, that is licensed by the state, which is out near the other side of Rochester, it's not doing very well. Why isn't it doing very well? They actually say we can't we can't compete against the Seneca Nation. Their belief is since the Seneca Nation stopped paying the state that um, that it gave them a, a huge competitive advantage. It really didn't because the, the Seneca Nation has been putting that money aside. It's not like they loosened up the machines or spent a half a billion dollars on promotion and marketing. No, they haven't done that. But the Lago, the state's licensed casino, it's it's a failure. They can't even pay their debt service. They're only paying the interest on the loans it took to build the thing. They can't even pay their debt service. So it's it's not doing well. So, and this gets to the whole idea that, you know, you know what's the state going to do to make sure that their licensed casinos are, are profitable? Well, they could, re if the state really believes they have the power to shut native gaming down, they can just refuse to do a gaming combat. Of course, they won't do that if they're getting paid another billion dollars over the course of seven years. Because, you know, let me, and let me just back up a little bit. When I say 25% of the net slot drop, and I've talked about this before, so I want to go through it one more time. 25% of the net slot drop is 25% is of all the money that comes into a slot machine minus the payout of that slot machine. So the state gets 25% of that with nothing taken out other than, than the payments. The 75% that the Seneca Nation gets to keep, they've got to pay for the building. They got to pay for the machine. They got to pay for the electric. They got to pay for the cocktail waitress and waitresses or waiters. They've got to pay for all of the other amenities that go along with bringing people into the door to, to play those slot machines. The state pays none of it. They get 25%. So if, if you do the math, that 25% of the net slot drop, that might be closer to 48, maybe even 50% of the of the slot revenue. When you take when the Santa Nation pays for everything else, licensing and you know, leases and you know, and all of the other costs that you know that, that go in to providing that footprint for that slot machine. That's what the Santa Nation has, has to pay out of their end, out of their 75%. So by the time you knock that down, that 25 percent the 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 state got is starting to look closer to again closer to 50 percent of, of the of the total slot revenue, you know, minus the cost. So what's the state going to do? Well, the state can do a couple of things. They can eliminate the competition from their state licensed casinos by not re renewing a compact, especially if the Seneca Nation and maybe other nations say we're not going to pay you any more revenue sharing. So it doesn't make any sense that the state state would even have that kind of power. 
I mean, it's inconsistent with the 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 legislative intent of of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. It's it, and of course it's immoral. It, it's unethical. Uh, you know, but <laughs> that doesn't stop New York State. So again, the question is that is being asked now is whether the compact as it exists uh, has provided a legal framework for revenue sharing. And they're asking that question. And, and the answer to that question is, it should be a categorical, no, it should, no, it isn't. But the two bigger questions that go beyond the compact between the Seneca Nation and the state of New York, which addresses revenue sharing and state power over Native gaming, are those second two questions. Whether revenue sharing as it exists in many states is legal because, and again, the question is, are the states providing some, some concession to native gaming that is substantial and quantifiable for what they're receiving in terms of revenue sharing? That's, that's a question that's got to be asked. And it hasn't been. It, and it may have been asked, but it hasn't been answered. And, and the third question is whether the states have the power to shut a native casino down simply by failing or refusing to renew a, a gaming compact. So my message to Seneca Nation is, I'm glad you're asking question number one, but you got to ask the other two. Because they impact your question number one, and it impacts everybody else. There's more at stake. This isn't just you. You, you know, Second Nation in many ways lowered the bar for everybody over gaming because of the, the, the compact that they entered into. And, and it's come back to bite them in the ass hard, especially over, you know, over the state pressing arbitration, two white guys on their arbitration panel to rule against the Seneca Nation and force them. I mean, look, if, if on, on question number one, it's really simple. Can the state force a native game, a gaming facility to pay them um, revenue sharing? Because that's what's happening. The Seneca Nation doesn't agree to pay. The arbitration panel is trying to force them, the, at least the two white guys on that, on that arbitration panel. The federal government and the courts are trying to force them to pay because they're deferring back to the arbitration. But nobody has been successful at, at deferring back to the Interior Department until now. But the two bigger questions is whether revenue sharing as it is existing in many places where states are literally extorting money out of gaming operations, native gaming operations, in the form of revenue sharing. And the power for that extortion is coming by not having an answer to question number three. Whether a state can dangle their power over, over native gaming by simply saying, I don't like your operation. I'm not getting anything out of it. You don't want to do revenue sharing. Um, I'm going to license my own casinos and we don't need you around. So we're going to walk away and, and force a shutdown by, um, by not renewing a compact. That's, I mean, <laughs> that has to be the, the other question. There is a fourth question. And the fourth question is, goes back to what I talked about in the beginning of the, of the program. Should the Senate Nation sue the state for the $1.4 billion that they paid? Because if, if the requirement or that test is whether a state has provided something that is both substantial and quantifiable, well, what good would it do to, to quantify what the state's concession was if you weren't going to hold the state accountable? Because I would argue that if, if somebody were to look at what the, the state actually conceded, if anything, it sure as hell isn't $1.4 billion. So, and I'm hoping some, some folks on Seneca Nation Council are, are hearing this. Because I think it would be beautiful for the, for the Seneca Nation to be able to tell Andrew Cuomo, the half billion that we've got sitting in an account, we're not giving it to you. The other half billion that you're anticipating getting between now and, and the end of 2023, you're not getting that either. In fact, we're going to sue you for a billion of that 1.4 billion that you took from us in the first period because it was illegal. The four, uh, the, the uh, 400 million that, that came back to Western New York, they're fine. It was always our intent to be good neighbors. But the idea that you extorted us for a billion dollars that you took a billion dollars out of Western New York to go to Albany that never came back. And you did so 
all the while you were competing against us with your slot parlors at these racetracks and using us to pave the way for you to do a constitutional referendum and change your state constitution so you could put casinos in places like Rochester? Now, if you put any value and if you bring in experts to, to evaluate whether the state conceded anything and, and if they did concede something, what the value of that was, you'd be lucky if it comes to $400 million over 14 years. So, man, I hope, this, I hope those, those powers that be at Senate Nation don't, do not neglect asking that second question about revenue sharing in general, what constitutes a legal revenue sharing, not just your compact but just in general, based on IGRA and whether the states have the power to, to shut you down by refusing to negotiate, renegotiate a compact or renew a compact. And man, I just hope somebody, I would just love for somebody to have the nerve to say, Andrew Cuomo, we're suing you for a billion bucks. We want a billion of that back. We want it back. You, you took us and, and we want it back. I just think that'd be great. So that's what I wanted to talk about here. Look, there's, there are other things at play. You know, I've done a couple of shows talking about how this, you know, how the, the state of New York is criminalizing business. There's a lot of things that are changing. And look, as much as I wasn't euphoric about Deb Haaland, you know, coming to the helm uh, at the Interior Department, once she did, it's on us to see what we can get her to do. I mean, we can't just sit back and hope she's going to do the right thing. We got to force her. We got to force the state to do what it needs to do. We got to force the interior department to do what it needs to do. It needs to review. It needs to answer those three questions. And you know what? And if, if the Seneca nation decides to sue the state for the billion dollars that they already took from them, the interior department should be the lead witness. They should be the agency that backs up the Seneca nation and say, yeah, the state didn't really concede anything. And they certainly didn't concede anything to the Seneca Nation that was worth a billion for. Come on, Seneca Nation, step up. Please step up. There, this isn't just in your best interest. You can actually change the, the Indian gaming. You can actually raise the bar instead of lo lowering it the way you've had in the past. So I'm hoping some counselors... Uh, you know, check out the podcast. If you're listening to this podcast and be, you know, look, share this with, with counselors, share it with the Seneca nation, you know, share it in Aquasasi, share it in Oneida. If you are native and, and you are somehow the beneficiary of gaming, native gaming in certainly in New York state, uh, Aquasasi, Oneida or, or Seneca territory, it's in all your best interest to make sure that your gaming enterprise survives. I'm not a big fan. I'm going to admit, I'm not a big fan of native gaming. I think it becomes a bit of a tail wagging the dog, but it really becomes a bit of a tail wagging the dog when it's not just a gaming enterprise. It's a bunch of white lawyers or whitish lawyers and consultants and, and lobbyists who really have to ask the question, are we being lobbied or are they lobbying who? I mean, there's a big question on who's being worked over because when you've got, again, over 14 years of advice coming from your legal counsel that tells you to just keep paying and don't fight it. And then when you do fight it, they put the weakest possible fight out there. This isn't the first time the Seneca Nations had a letter from the Interior Department. They had one that they never used during their arbitration battle. And what happened? They lost. So, look, if you're on council now, you weren't on council when this original compact was signed. You're in a better position to stand strong than perhaps even some of the you know older counselors, you know, uh, perhaps better than they could. So step up. Do the right thing. Fight the state. Sue their asses. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.